Good afternoon. <clears throat> a motorist with poor eyesight was driving through a dense fog and he was trying desperately to save within the lines and follow the taillights in the car ahead of him. As he squinted and worried along his way, trying to stay on course, the car in front of him suddenly stopped and he ran his car into the back of him. The driver of the rear car got out and demanded to know why the other driver came to such an abrupt stop. I had to, he said. I'm parking in my garage. <laughs> Today's gospel is about vision, about a blind man asking to be saved. Today's gospel passage tells us of the cure of the blind man of Jericho, Bartimaeus. He heard that Jesus was passing by and understood that it was an opportunity of a lifetime and acted swiftly. The reaction to those present, that many rebuked him, telling him to be silent, makes evidence the obvious pretension of the healthy and wealthy of those days. Keep the blind, keep those that we don't like to see out of sight. It is that misery should and must be hidden, that it should not show itself, that those who are blind and have other disabilities should not disturb the sight and comfort of those who are physically strong and financially well off. The term blind has been charged with so many negative meanings over the years that it might be time to focus it on moral blindness, on ignorance, of intolerance, and of those who are insensitive. Bartimaeus is not blind. He's only sightless. He sees better than his, those with his heart than many of those around him see because he has faith, and Bartimaeus cherished hope. More than that, it is this interior faith that also helps him to recover his external vision of things. Go, your faith has made you well, Jesus says to him. So what does that mean to see? We can recognize that as Christians, we have both physical sight, but we also have spiritual sight. Many of us come to church and practice our faith to pursue that spiritual sight. While physical sight is obviously very important in our daily lives, we can also recognize that spiritual sight is an absolute necessity for our salvation. To understand this Bible passage, we must also have spiritual sight. Like the blind man, we must pray to Jesus, my teacher, let me see again. And when we receive spiritual sight, we come to know and understand the importance of this capacity. By embracing a spiritual heart and applying our gift of spiritual sight, we can see the way to achieve our own salvation. The spiritual works of mercy have long been a part of our Christian tradition, and they can be offered a guide for spiritual sight. They appear in the works of theologians and spiritual writers throughout history. Jesus, as, just as Jesus attended to the spiritual wealth of those that he's around him, it also offered us the opportunity to hear his words and to practice those in today. To help us understand and to open our eyes to spiritual blindness, Let's review the seven spiritual works of mercy. The first is to counsel the doubtful. We all have moments of doubt of our, in our faith journey. Nevertheless, we should always remember that the Gospels offer us guidance to find our way. For example, has someone asked you for advice? Has someone struggled with faith and asked you to help them? Think of how Christ might offer counsel to the doubtful. Another example to be aware of the signs and symptoms of despair in yourself and others and respond to them with hope. Have you ever doubted your faith? I know I've been approached over the years. I was ordained almost 29 years ago and even before I was ordained I was active in my local churches and as a deacon I've been approached by people who are questioning elements of their faith. It has especially been true with the stories of clergy sexual abuse of children and the painful legacy of Indian boarding schools. But that's not who we are. That's some of the practices that we must repent for. But that's not what Catholicism is. The second is to instruct the uneducated. Learn about our faith and be open to talking with others about our beliefs. There's always something to discover about our Catholic faith. For example, 
We might volunteer to help with religious education programs here at our parish. I would really encourage you that after Mass to walk right next door to Presentation Hall. Our ministry fair today and tomorrow has all kinds of wonderful opportunities for us to instruct the uneducated, to help others who are truly in need, even those who are winter visitors. We can always use your help for the few months that you're here. Another example, don't be shy about evangelizing. As Pope Francis reminds us, either the faith grows or we need to invest in mothballs. Make sure that our children and grandchildren are properly catechized. Catholic school tuition might be a burden for some, but we know it's well worth it as they grow up. The third is to admonish the sinner, not to judge but to be supportive in helping others find their way and to correct their mistakes. Together we can learn to walk more closely with Christ when we try to help those who are struggling. For example, God so highly prized admonishing the sinner and bringing him back to, on the right path that he promised salvation and the forgiveness of many of our personal sins by simply bringing back one who was straying as a sinner. And also, in humility, we can strive to create a culture that doesn't accept sin while realizing that we all fail at times. That's why we are offered the sacrament of reconciliation. We can respond to negativity and prejudice with positive statements. We can help the speaker to gently recognize their hypocrisy and their disregard of the golden rule. The fourth is to comfort the sorrowful to be open to listening and comforting those who are dealing with grief and loss. Even if we aren't sure of the right words to say, our presence can make a big difference. For example, we can lend a listening ear to those going through a tough time. This is especially relevant today as we have families who've lost so much due to cancer and COVID over these past few years. We can make a home-cooked meal for a friend write a letter or send a card to someone who's facing a difficult time. To forgive all offenses willingly is the fifth spiritual work of mercy. Forgiving others is difficult at times because we don't have God's limitless mercy and compassion. But Jesus does teach us that we should forgive as God forgives, relying on him to help us show others the mercy of God when we can't do it alone. We can ask for God's help. Several quotes, biblical quotes, can guide us this way. Be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. My wife and I actually have that rule for us in our household, and it's helped over 36 years. So it's usually me, but anyway. <laughs> Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. We, heard that we hear this in the Our Father about forgiving offenses willingly. I tell you not seven times, but 70 times seven, you must forgive. The sixth is to bear wrongs patiently. Do not be bitter about wrongs that have been done to us. We can place our hope in God so that we can endure the troubles of this world and face them with a compassionate spirit. For example, are you frustrated with someone? Step away from the situation, take a few deep breaths, and say a prayer asking God for patience. We can let go of our bitterness. We can ask ourselves if we contributed to this difficult situation. And the seventh spiritual work of mercy is to pray for the living and the dead. Prayer is one of the most powerful ways that we can support others. Join together in prayer for the living and the dead and trust us all into God's care. For example, we can request a mass intention for a friend or family member who has passed away or for someone who has lost a close friend. I do that every May because I have three very close family members who died in May over the years. Be open to, sp to spontaneous prayer when circumstances suggest it. When I was a child growing up in the Midwest, if we went by a car accident, in the, our family in the car, my mom would all lead us in saying a Hail Mary that whoever was in the accident would recover fully. She was full of prayer, and she meant it. We can also keep our book of, our book of prayer intentions. 
listing the names of those that we're keeping in our prayers. Today's gospel is about healing a blind man 2,000 years ago. <clears throat> but it is a relevant story today. Many of us may remember the story of Helen Keller, who was so brave and inspiring in her deafness and blindness. She once wrote a magazine article entitled, Three Days to See. In that article, she outlined what she would do if she were granted just three days of sight. It was a powerful, thought-provoking article. On the first day, she said she wanted to see her friends. On day two, she would spend it seeing nature. And on the third day, she would spend it in her hometown of New York City, watching the busy streets and all the sights and sounds that would encompass her. She concluded with these words, if you are blind, I who am blind can give one hint to those who can see. Use your eyes as if tomorrow you were to be stricken blind. Imagine what your life would be without our sight. On a more personal note, sometimes you might see me rubbing my eyes. This sight thing is important to me. Over the past 30 some years, I've undergone three corneal transplants, had, three, had cataracts removed from both eyes, and had lenses installed in both of my eyes. As a result, over these years, I've been, I, I struggled with eye patches, stitch removals, blurred vision, doctor visits, not driving at night, photosensitivity, always wearing my sunglasses, and other minor inconveniences. But because of the top quality surgeons in the area where I was living and improving medical conditions, I'm blessed to be able to see pretty well today. But I also give thanks to God, for he has also allowed me to see and to continue the work that I do. I believe that God has a plan for me to continue doing the work as a husband, as a dad, as a friend, as a deacon, and in my profession where I work with fathers to be the kind of men that their children need. When we have spiritual sight, we're able to speak up against the evils of the world and challenge the falsehoods that are infecting our nation. We are all stewards. We are entrusted with gifts. We don't own these gifts. We use these gifts for a particular time, and eventually we're given back to God, whom, get, whom we got all of our gifts from. Today, I ask that we all join in prayer this week for the grace of God to shine on those in need so that their eyes may be opened and remain focused on the good works that we need to do to continue God's plan.